Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased true crime channel. Thanks for watching. First on the docket, Lori Vallow is broke. Is this a sign that the marital bliss is over? Second, on the Josh Duggar case, no good deed goes unpunished. Third, Harvey is still screwing people. Fourth, an update on the Sydney Sutherland case. And for those of you who don't remember this case or are not familiar with it, wait until you hear about this. And then finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Crime Talk, and my name is Scott Reich. Thank you for watching. If you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button as well as hit that little bell so that you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. Today is Monday. Tomorrow is Tuesday. That means we'll go live tomorrow at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Please join us. All right, let's get straight to the docket. Lori Vallow is broke. Now, we know she's in custody, and we knew early on in the case that maybe some of the monies that were received from her husband, Chad Daybell, regarding the death of his wife, Tammy Daybell, may have been used to pay for her attorney's fees. I have mentioned this all along, and not to say that I was right, but I thought I was right again. I was very surprised that Mark Means had stayed on this case this long. There's no way you could work on a case with this much discovery, put this much time in it to do an effective job and not completely blow through the initial retainer that was been paid. Clearly, Mr. Means had to go back to somebody and say, hey, where can I get some money? Apparently, Chad Daybell isn't paying anymore. So what could that mean? Well, does that mean he's broke too? We do know that his attorney, Mr. Pryor, has a lien on his property, so maybe that's what's going to pay the attorney's bills from here on out. I think there's some ethical issues regarding that. Certainly can't do that here in the state that I practice, but things must be different in the state of Idaho. So then the question becomes, hmm, we know that Chad Day Bell, through his counsel, has moved for a separate trial from Lori Vallow, and Lori Vallow said, hey, I want to be in a joint trial with you. Maybe the separation, the cracks in that marital bliss are beginning to separate. Do you think, I mean, don't you think if your wife was in custody for a crime that she had nothing to do with and you believed her, you would do everything you can. You'd go to your friends, your family to get money for her, to pay her attorney's fees. The most important thing going on in her life, it's her liberty. You don't go cheap on your trial counsel. Well, now Mr. Means has asked the court and the court has found that Lori Vallow is indigent. What does that mean? She's in custody. She can't afford to pay for her attorney. Normally, the office of the public defender would then be appointed to represent her. But what would that mean? It would mean that the case would have to start all over again for the attorney to get up to speed, to investigate, to review, analyze, draft motions. That can take some serious time. So the court said, we're just going to appoint a private attorney in this particular case, kind of almost assuming that there's a conflict or out of the ends of justice, so to speak. We're going to appoint Mr. Means. Now, it varies from state to state, but now Mr. Means probably not getting his normal hourly rate, but he could be getting anywhere between $45 and maybe $80 an hour. Apparently, Mr. Means wants to stay on the case. He's going to get state rates. And guess what? The court is going to have to review any billings in his case before he can get paid. So he's going to have to justify it and it better be good work. We'll continue to see, but it looks like the relationship of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell may have a few splinters. Next on the docket, Josh Duggar case. You know, everyone's talked about him. He is the former reality TV do I want to use the word star? Do I want to use the word participant? Either way, it doesn't matter. He is no longer a reality TV star. He is accused of possessing items that are inappropriate that involve children. 
Bottom line, what can you say? Well, he's out. And we mentioned this yesterday that uh, news media was hanging out around the house where Josh Duggar is residing. He's not residing there with his wife and children because he can't be around anyone under the age of 18, even his own children, unless his wife is present. Not really sure why the judge allowed that, but hey, it is what it is. Well, the 911 call was released, and I appreciate this lady's concern that there's a car outside on this road near her house, but guess what? It's public property. You invite yourself into a situation like this, you're going to get the circus that comes along with it. So although I feel some sympathy to the nice people that decided to take Mr. Duggar into their house pending pretrial release, you can always revoke that decision at any time. All right, next on the docket, Harvey. Remember that guy, the big movie mogul? We won't mention his last name because YouTube will censor us. That's right. He was convicted in New York and now he has cases pending in LA. He is still screwing people, even when he's no longer producing movies and in custody. Why, you may say, Scott, how could he have done that? Well, his company was sold to basically pay off all the debts. And Spyglass Media, then called Lantern, came to deal to acquire most of Weinstein's assets for $289 million. But did Spyglass first have to pay Weinstein's old debts before taking over contracts that would give them rights to many films and uh, TV shows? That's what all the people in Hollywood wanted to know, particularly people that were owed money, including Bradley Cooper, Jennifer Lawrence, Robert De Niro, Meryl Streep, Bill Murray, and Julia Roberts. They think they should have been paid. Well, one of the cases went up regarding the producer director of Silver Lining Playbook, Bruce Cohen. And what took place was is that he got paid a chunk of money up front and he was gonna get paid more money on the back end, basically for royalties. In this particular case, he was owed $400,000 at the time of the bankruptcy. Bankruptcy court said, no, you really don't get any more money. Sorry about that. That's what happens when people go to bankruptcy. I'm sure Harvey's really broken up about it. Well, that was the test case. It would seem that all of these other people are going to lose money in royalties on the back end as well. All right, next on the docket, an update on the Sydney Sutherland case. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Sutherland's case, Miss Sutherland was 25 years old and a gentleman has been charged with her death, a guy by the name of Quake Llewellyn. He's 28 years old and he lives down in Arkansas, down in Jonesboro, and he's supposed to be a farmer. Well, apparently he's also an alleged real creepy dude who likes to go around ramming people with his truck, dragging them into a field, sexually assaulting them and murdering them. That's right. That's what Mr. Llewellyn is charged with. Now we'll give him the presumption of innocence, but well, he has confessed to it. So it's a little harder for us to actually do that. We brought you this story and when Mr. Llewellyn was talking to the police, he said he just tried to forget about it. And he resumed his routine after burying the woman's body in a field. He, he told that to a uh, psychologist uh, gauging his fitness for trial at the time. Now his attorney has filed some 50 some odd motions in this case, and that's fine. He is doing what his attorney is supposed to do, filing motions protecting his rights. One of the uh, motions is a change of venue uh, motions, which cites very similar to a lot of cases. However, this is a very small community and it may just work. And I think that the motion was actually pretty well written in this one paragraph states, nothing in this motion derogates the constitutional rights of the citizens of Jackson County to express their views. However, this expression cannot be permitted to work to the detriment of a defendant's constitutional right to a fair trial by an impartial jury. An attempt to assemble an impartial jury in a small population county inundated with the case is bound to fail. Change of venue is the mechanism to vindicate the right to a fair trial before an impartial jury. That's very good language, and that is language that we're gonna see not only in this particular case, 
but that of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. So hopefully if any of those attorneys are watching, there's some really great language in their motion. So while the defense has filed some 47 motions in this particular case, the prosecutor has stated that they are going to continue to persist in the death penalty. Not surprising, this is a case that has grabbed many, many people throughout the country. When all this woman was doing, Miss Sydney Sutherland was out doing was jogging, minding her own business. And then this guy, take a look at that guy. This guy wasn't even in Miss Sutherland's league. Um, and well, we'll just leave it at that. We'll give him the presumption of innocence. Before we continue on with the docket, let's take a quick recess. And if the Sutherland case doesn't make you want to check out all the creepy guys in the world, well, maybe the Sutherland case will help you do that. And if you're going to do that, take a look at our sponsor. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about, what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're gonna get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's gonna give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're gonna find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's gonna be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. All right, and we're back. Let's get right to the docket. Our next thing we have is our dumb criminal contestant of the day. But before we get there, let's do our dumb criminal contestant winner from last week. That's right, Jesse James Moore. You are our dumb criminal contestant of the week and you get a cool Crime Talk mug. Now, if you would like to get a mug without having to become a contestant, all you have to do is hit the link below. We've got some really cool stuff there, not just mugs. If you wanna buy one, great. If you don't, that's okay too. I'm not gonna lose any sleep on it a night, but a lot of people like the mugs. And if you take the picture with your mug, we can put it up on our mug shot. Our dumb criminal contestant of the day, Marty Martinez. He was found sleeping behind a wheel of a pickup on Interstate 75. The deputy said that he opened the truck's door and Mr. Martinez woke up. He saw a white powdery substance on Mr. Martinez's nose and noticed a strong smell of whiskey coming from Mr. Martinez's breath. Mr. Martinez allegedly had bloodshot watery eyes and spoke with slurred Spanish and had trouble for performing tasks. When the deputy asked Mr. Martinez to get out of the vehicle, he forgot to put the car in park and it rolled forward. The deputy had to put the vehicle in park so Mr. Martinez could exit the car. After failing multiple field sobriety tests, Ooh, big surprise there. The deputy arrested Martinez under probable cause for driving under the influence of alcohol. And you would think that would be it. But wait, there's more. That's right. The deputy used two sets of handcuffs to detain Mr. Martinez, citing concerns for comfort, which is code for he was a man of size. While Mr. Martinez was in the back of the patrol car, the deputy watched as he took multiple phone calls, and then pulled two baggies of white powdery substances out of his pocket. As deputies began completing their paperwork, Mr. Martinez then put both bags of the controlled substance in his anus, according to the report. When he was taken to the jail, a strip search was done, and lo and behold, what did they find? That's right, a couple of baggies that Mr. Martinez had strategically placed in his anus. So now he's charged with the DUI possession, tampering with evidence, tampering with evidence. Who would have thought? I would have thought maybe introduction of contraband into a jail. Either way, Mr. Martinez, you are a dumb criminal contestant of the day. Everybody knows don't put controlled substances up your butt. Throw them out the window. Have you not been watching the dumb criminals? But make sure you, when you do that, there's not an officer on the other side of the car that's going to see the controlled substance thrown out. Yep. We had that dumb criminal too. All right, 
Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you had a great weekend. Please go back and watch our last two videos from Thursday and Friday. I think they're really good. Hope you'll enjoy them. Have a great day.